And now, in studio, bringing his Midwest values from the show me state to the land of San Diego. He's a triple threat, licensed as an attorney, mortgage broker, and a top producing realtor who's crushing the competition. Here to deliver you what's happening in the trenches of the market, your host, Michael Gaddis. Good evening, San Diego. Welcome to the Michael Gaddis Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. I am your host, Michael Gaddis. I am a top producing real estate broker, a licensed California attorney, and an NMLS licensed mortgage broker. I truly am San Diego's real real estate expert. I am here every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. to discuss anything and everything related to San Diego real estate. As always, I welcome any questions or issues that you would like to hear me discuss on the show. There are several ways that you could contact me. First, you could call me at 888-242-2272. That's 888-242-2272. You can also email me at michael at michaelgaddis.com. Or you can visit my website at www.michaelgaddis.com. AM 1170 The Answer is now an interactive radio station. Download the AM 1170 The Answer app to see what you hear on the radio and save it to your smartphone. Listen and interact all day, every day. Download the AM 1170 The Answer app and enter to win a $100 gift certificate to Vigalucci's Italian Restaurant. That's right. That's Vigalucci's Italian Restaurant. And you heard Vittorio, the general manager of the Lucadia location, on my radio show a few weeks ago. Contest ends October 31st, 2015. So before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about last night. Last night, I went to a Chamber of Commerce function at Jake's in Del Mar. If you have never been to Jake's in Del Mar, you are really missing out. I swear to God, I have was, I've was i been there a few times, but every single time I go there, I am amazed by the location and the views that that particular uh, restaurant has. I mean, it is literally stunning. You will be extremely hard-pressed to find anywhere, not just in San Diego, but in all of Southern California to find a better restaurant with a better location. So you guys should go down there and visit Jake's at Del Mar and tell him Michael sent you down there. So as many of you already know, my legal practice specializes in helping distressed homeowners. People always ask me what makes me so good at helping homeowners with loan modifications. They always ask, is it because you're an attorney? The truth is no. The reason that I'm good at helping distressed homeowners with loan modifications is because I'm a lawyer, a real estate broker, and a mortgage broker. The three skill sets combined are exactly what is needed to try to combat these banks. Of the three skill sets, the most important one by far, at least in my opinion, is the mortgage broker aspect of it. The lawyer side makes them talk to me. It's being able to talk to them in their own language that really, really helps facilitate loan modifications. So that's where the mortgage side comes in because I have the I could basically speak the same language as the lender. So I have a message for all of you distressed homeowners out there. And you know who you are. Anyone who's struggling with their payments or has been late for a period of time, uh, my message to you is this. Stop it. I mean it. Stop it. Every day I get calls in my office from distressed homeowners that have either backed themselves into a corner or are facing imminent foreclosure that are just completely out of touch with reality. You see, the moment that a homeowner starts missing payments, you're bombarded with solicitations promising leprechauns, rainbows, and unicorns. Homeowners are so desperate to find someone willing to tell them what they want to hear that they will blindly follow these promises until the point of near oblivion. That's usually when they call me. Usually they call me when they're about ready to, when everything is about ready to hit the fan. And they call me crying that they've been misled and that the banks aren't working with them or that they paid thousands of dollars and nothing has happened or that the bank is out to get them and they have a trustee sale next week. So what do I say to all of this? Stop it. Stop chasing leprechauns and unicorns. They do not exist. Look, when people call my office for a free consultation, one of the first things that I tell them is whether they want me to tell them the truth or a lie. And of course, they're usually taken back by that, but I'm being honest with them because 
I don't tell people what they want to hear. I only tell people what I think the truth is. So I tell them that they're trying to contact me basically just to tell them exactly what they want to hear to make all their feelings go away so they can feel nice and fluffy. I'm not the guy to call. I'm about reality. If we were in a library, I would be in the nonfiction section, not the fiction section. So anyway, I've been helping distressed homeowners fight to get loan modifications since 2008. Over the years, I have gotten pretty good at recognizing which homeowners have a good chance at obtaining a loan modification and which ones do not. So I'm going to share some loan modification tips for distressed homeowners out there. So all of you who are listening, who are one of the people I mentioned above, you need to really pay attention to the next few minutes because you're going to learn a lot. Number one, lenders are not your friends. They are not there to help you. They're there to assess you. Remember that. Their best interest is their investor's best interest, not yours. The only thing they are doing is assessing your ability to pay and to see if that meshes with the guidelines of the investors. So do not rely on the fact that they are your friends. Although I, The next thing I want to give you is, although I do encourage homeowners to seek assistance from a competent lawyer, beware of scams. Do not pay upfront fees. That violates SB 94. You do not know how many people call me in a given week and tell me they have paid upfront fees. Do not do that. That violates SB 94, and I don't care if they're an attorney. I don't care who they are. If you doubt me, go to the California State Bar Association website. It will clarify it for you. So anybody who is trying to take upfront money for you for to do a loan modification, you need to hang up the phone or walk away. Also, do not believe that the process is simple. The process is not simple. It is very difficult. It's difficult for me, and I do this all the time. I've been doing it forever. I know their systems. I know people at the bank, and it can still be challenging for me. So do not believe pie in the sky and that, oh, yeah, it's no problem. We're going to get you a 40-year term loan on a 2% interest rate, and everything's going to be great. Don't do it. Also, do not waste time. If you are missing payments, time is not on your side. You need to make sure you maximize the amount of time that you have. Although, and although that the Homeowner's Bill of Rights prevents lenders from dual tracking while loan modification is, re- is in review, this does not go into effect until the lender has received a complete file. Make sure it is complete because their get out of jail card, free card is you did not submit all the necessary paperwork. So make sure that everything that you do is uh, completed and you make sure you follow up with them on a regular basis and please take the person's name, the date, the time. Make sure you take very, very detailed notes of what they're telling you. And there are a lot of things that make loan modifications more difficult and we've talked about this in previous shows. Equity makes it more difficult if you own multiple homes, if you're self-employed, if you've had previous loan modifications, certain servicers make it more difficult. And if you have a currently scheduled payment that is really low, that can also make it more difficult. So keep all of these things in mind. If any of these any of the points I just mentioned are you, it makes your your loan modification a little more difficult than the average one. And also, banks will always tell you that, that you do not need help, but I believe you do. It's like playing a game of Monopoly where I know the rules and you don't. And I tell you every time you roll the dice, oh, well, sorry, you lose a turn and you need to pay me $200. You don't know whether that's the truth or not because they're the only ones that know the rules. Find your own champion to represent you. You don't know the rules. Sometimes small things can cause major problems. Think mis- minor communication issues between you and the lender can really cause you problems. So make sure that that you know whoever is championing you is familiar with the process. And believe it or not, sometimes the underwriters at the bank are wrong. It is nearly impossible for you to challenge them on on your own because you don't know the rules. You don't know how they're supposed to be looking at income. You don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Find someone who does. And you do, and lastly, you don't have the connections needed to push the file. If you start, if you believe you're you're wrong, I mean that they're wrong, and, and you're correct. The problem is, how are you going to get your argument into somebody's lap who knows what they're doing? It's going to be very difficult for you to do that on their own. Now, another thing people say a lot is, well, you know, they just keep asking me for this document. They just keep asking me, and, and it's just, I just, I don't need to send it to them. Just give them what they want. Don't argue with the lender. If they want it, give it to them. Um, Take notes. Keep track of the date. 
And the other advice, follow up with the bank at least three times a week, preferably Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, no matter what they tell you. If they tell you, don't worry, don't contact us until next week. No, don't do it. Just keep contacting them because they'll probably tell you something different the next time you call in. And here's one more. Your dedicated point of contact does not know how loan modifications work. They are information conduits. Their purpose is to give and gather information. Do not take any advice on how to set up your loan modification package from them. They, that is not their skill set. They just relay information. And lastly, be realistic. Just be realistic with your expectations. You know, if you can't afford, uh, you know, a payment, you know, come to terms with that. So after the break, we're going to continue our discussion about short sales. You are listening to The Michael Gatta Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. AM 1170, The Answer.com. Hear us anywhere in San Diego and the world. AM 1170, The Answer. Craig Sewing here, host of The Craig Sewing Show. I want you to think in your head for a minute. How much money did you make last year? Here, here's a better question. How much money did you keep? In other words, how much of your harder money was for you rather than giving it away to this inefficient government of ours? If you think the government's inefficient, I got a challenge for you. I'm going to challenge your efficiency with your tax plan. My good friend Doug Jennings, who you hear on KCBQ all the time, is a savant when it comes to tax planning. As Doug puts it, Craig, I've never even seen a tax return I can't improve. Doug can help you keep more of your money, help you improve your structure for your taxes, your business, your real estate, even your marriage. Why wouldn't you take a moment to get a free consultation? can save you thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars. He's not really a friend of the IRS, but I'm a consumer advocate. I want him helping you. This is something you got to do. Visit JenningsTaxLaw.com for a free consultation on your tax plan. That's JenningsTaxLaw.com. You can thank me later. Doug is a great person, a great professional. He and his wife, Peggy, are friends of mine. I give him my highest recommendation, JenningsTaxLaw.com. Visit him today. Hey, Craig Sewing here, consumer activist. You hear me every day at 6 p.m. on KCBQ. My goal is to help you win in any marketplace. One of the things that applies to every single person that listens to our show and that's listening right now you have a credit score, and more likely than not, it has inaccuracies on it. Nobody seems to understand how these things work. Here's what I can tell you. I have a credit expert that's a partner in the show named Aran Sinai. I call him the credit magician. If you've ever had any issues with your credit, you want to get your scores up, maybe a foreclosure, bankruptcy, or maybe just a collection. You know the city of San Diego can send parking tickets to collections? Crazy. Well, bad credit's a choice. Reach out to Aran Sinai. How do you do that? You go to our website, AmericanDreamElite.com. AmericanDreamElite.com. Hit me up on the contact form. I'll connect you with Aran. AmericanDreamElite.com. If you've ever had any credit issues whatsoever, AmericanDreamElite.com. Who would you rather have representing you when buying or selling your home? A real estate agent or a real estate and mortgage broker who is also a licensed California attorney? To sell your home for top dollar or if you're facing a forced sale due to divorce, probate, short sale, or bankruptcy, you'll need the added value and marketing services of a realtor with the knowledge and experience of a licensed attorney and mortgage broker on your side. Hi, I'm Michael Gaddis. I give you more, but it doesn't cost you more. Visit michaelgaddis.com. That's Michael G A D D I S dot com. DRE 01465493 and MLS 800. Hi, this is AJ Gupta from the Gupta Legal Center. You've probably seen us on the American Dream TV show and the Craig Sewing Radio Show. We're honored to be featured as the exclusive real estate attorney and honored to be trusted by Craig and all of his top producing realtors. Our office was also featured as a super lawyer representing California's top 5% of attorneys. You may not know whether you need an attorney or not. My suggestion is you kind of have an idea whether there's a problem or a question. So I suggest if you don't know whether you need an attorney or not, give us a call. We'd be happy to pick up the phone. Give you a call back, figure out what it is that you need to have addressed. If we can't or don't know the issue, then we can definitely point you in the right direction. Our phone number is 619-866-3444. That's 619-866-3444. And that's guptalc.com. G-U-P-T-A-L-C.com. Welcome back to the Michael Gaddis Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. 
I am your host, Michael Gaddis of Michael Gaddis Realty Group and michaelgaddis.com. For the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about different short sale scenarios, and I want to give you an example of a real scenario that I'm dealing with right now. I have a client who has a house in Carmel Valley, and this particular house has two loans on it. Both of them were originally serviced by Flagstar Bank. When I when I went over to see the house, I noticed it had a lot of uh, distressed. Uh, it has a lot of distress. Usually, what happens with homes that are for short sale when people stop making payments, they stop taking care of their house. So, a lot of times, there's a lot of deferred maintenance. There's you know wood rot, termite issues, maybe some roof leaks, maybe some issues with drywall. There's just a lot of things that normally under normal conditions homeowners would take care of, but because these particular homeowners did not know if they were going to keep their house or not. They, you know, obviously they're not going to put money into something that, you know, if they're going to lose it. So the two loans that they had on their house um, were both purchase money loans. Now, purchase money loans are loans that uh, were used when they originally, they're the same loans they had when they originally purchased the home. Now, purchase money loans under California law um, carry certain protections. One, and the, probably one of the most important ones, is that they're non recourse loans, meaning the only ability that the lender has to do anything to recover is to basically recover the asset. So once the foreclosure takes place, it, they're done. That's it. So second lien holders in particular are a little bit more at risk with purchase money loans because they can't pursue any deficiency judgments or come after you or anything like that. So in this scenario, we had two Flagstar loans and you know, it, it started off okay. The only problem we had initially was that when we put it on the market, we were having a little bit of difficulty finding an acceptable um, a buyer because the property condition was so bad that FHA and VA buyers couldn't purchase the property because in order to, ha- to buy a property through FHA or VA, the property has to meet certain standards. And this property wasn't meeting it. And because there was so much deferred maintenance, it was making it impossible for us to find one of those. So the only people that we could really negotiate with are either conventional buyers or we could also, uh, you know, kind of approach investors. But when you approach an investor, you know what's going to happen. They're going to lowball you. They're going to try to pick it up for as low as possible. So I knew when I was watching the trend of us having to 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 drop price. Now, what we usually do is we try to st- we try to get the highest, most the fair market value of the house. So we we set it out at basically basically fair market value, and then as we go along, if we're not getting interest or we keep getting opposition based upon the condition of the house, we'll drop it incrementally until we start getting buyers. And in this particular situation, it was very difficult to find a buyer. The other problem with this particular house is right near the freeway, and it's when I say it's right near the freeway, I mean you could take a softball and throw it, and you'll probably hit the freeway. So, so we had a little bit of obsolescence issues as well as the fact that we had all the deferred maintenance. So, you know, during this time, the first lien was transferred from Flagstar to another lender. In, uh, servicer. Now, when I got the servicing change noticed, I I did not recognize the servicer. Now, for now for me, that's alarming because I've been doing this since 2008, and I know pretty much every servicer out there. So what that told me is when I don't recognize a servicer, that it's probably a very small investor that purchased this note. And that this particular servicing company was going to be difficult to deal with because usually the people who buy these notes like this are not in it to really resolve situations or work with you. They're in it to foreclose. They have a set. It's an investment tool. They buy these at a reduced amount. They come in, they get them through, they either foreclose on them or give them cash for keys. And then they try to basically, uh, you know, just get as much out of it as they can. So I knew it was going to be challenging. And I was right, because the very first day that the transfer took place, I get a phone call, not from the servicer, I get a phone call from the investor. And the investor says, hello, how are you? I'm Mr. Investor, and we want to foreclose on the house. That's the very first thing they said. Is there any way you think that they'll negotiate cash for keys? So I had to explain to this to, to the investor, I said, look, I anticipated your phone call. So here's the deal. The house has a lot of deferred maintenance. It ha- we have the obsolescence issue because it's right on the f- a major freeway. And I said, and we've been trying to market it for some time. Now, thankfully, the day before the guy called me, we finally found an FHA buyer that was willing to come in. Now, you said, well, I thought, Michael, I thought you said that you couldn't use an FHA buyer. Well, this particular situation is different because 
the the sellers and the buyer had agreed that they were both going to pitch in and try to try to get the property up to FHA standards before the appraisal came out. So it's very unusual because the sell most sellers won't put any money into a property, but these particular sellers were did not want a short sale for many reasons, and they were willing to invest some money in order to fix it. So thankfully, when the investor called, I had an offer in place, and I told him I do have an offer, and the offer that we were given. Uh, by the uh, by, the agent, the other agent was was a very reasonable offer. It wasn't one of those super lowball ones that they're going to laugh at. So I explained the entire situation to the first lien holder, and I sent over the offer, and he took a look at it, and he said it's not enough. I want it a little bit higher. He wanted his net to be higher. Um, I tried to explain to him how that was going to be difficult, but he says, look, if you want us to work with uh, you, then that's what we're going to have to do. And the reason I had to work with him is because I didn't have time to find another buyer because there was a sale date approaching. Now, when you have a sale date with a very small investor like this, these guys are, I mean, this is a very small entity. That's what these guys do. So they just gather these things and they foreclose. But I worked with them. I provided pictures of all the deferred maintenance in the house. I showed them what our plan was and how the, the sellers were actually going to contribute to it. And then I went to the buyer and told them they needed to increase their offer in order to make this happen. And the buyer said yes. So I went back to the investor and the investor says, okay, why don't you go ahead and uh, I'll issue approval. So he gave us an approval till October 27th. Now, the wild card in all of this is the second lien holder. The second lien holder was Flagstar. However, when we called in to, to provide borrowers, borrower's authorization and submit a short sale package, we were told that the, that the uh, servicing had been transferred, the loan had been sold. Now, we didn't get any documentation to support that, so I, st- I inquired with the buyers, did you get any information about a sale of the second lien? They said no. And I said, well, that's weird. So we started hitting really hard Flagstar's customer service department saying, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And we kept getting the same answer. Nobody could find the loan. They said it must have been service transferred. So it, you know, it was real. We were reading a roadblock and the time is ticking, remember, because we had a definite, we have a definite date to close this loan. So I had to take steps the extraordinary steps. I had to step out of my real estate broker shoes and I had to step into my lawyer's shoes. So what did I do? I approached the legal department of Flagstar, alerted them to the problem. Now, I I have to give Flagstar credit here because Flagstar's legal department really jumped on top of it. They responded to me within a, a very reasonable amount of time. They said they were investigating. Now it did. It, here's the irony: it took the legal department a while to find out what was going on with the loan. So she called me in a couple. The the, the legal counsel for the uh, Flagstar called me in a couple of days and said, "Well, I'm pretty sure it's still our loan, but it's just the way it's categorized. It's being transferred around." She had difficulty finding and locating the person that I needed to be talking to. Finally, they did. She f- was able to connect me with the right person. Well, time is ticking the entire time. I mean, I'm literally on the clock because I'm, I'm not sure if that first lien holder is going to give me an extension. In the meantime, I told the buyer to continue with their loan process. Try to push that loan process as quickly as they can so that there's as little, as li- as little needs to be done as possible when we finally do you know, secure both, uh, both approvals. So we finally found the person at Flagstar. We submitted the documentation and... What happened was we got an answer, and the answer was, it's not good enough. We want more money. And I was just stunned. I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) You want more money? First of all, you didn't even know where this loan was. I said, it was in no man's land. I'm I'm knocking on your door, giving you an allocation. And they said, well, the allocation's not sufficient. And I said, okay, you realize this is a purchase money loan. You have no recourse if the first lien holder fall, if, if files uh, foreclosure. You're basically done. And I'm knocking on your door, giving you an opportunity to give you some money that you thought wasn't there. And, you know, so she was really stubborn. So what did I do? I went and put my lawyer pants back on and I went over to uh, the legal department again. And, you know, oh, I forgot to tell you, the one thing they did tell me is that they required, a, they said, if they want to do this short sale, they need to give us a cash contribution. And she sent that to me in writing. And that's a no-no in the state of California. You cannot require a cash contribution from the seller in order to, uh, to you know, issue an, uh, an approval. 
So I went to the legal department and I said, hey, look, you guys, I don't want to cause any problems for you guys. I just need my approval. Your girl just put this in writing here that you needed, uh, you know, a cash contribution. Do I need to say more? I said, not to mention the practical aspects of it that, look, if this thing goes to foreclosure, you guys aren't getting anything. And I said, I'm just looking at this from a business perspective and a legal perspective. It just doesn't make sense on either one. And she said, well, let me take a look at it. So she took a look at it. And again, kudos to her in the legal department of Flagstar, because I just got my approval for the second lien for the terms that we wanted. So I'm, the only reason I tell you guys this story is because it is very difficult to do short sales. Not everybody can do them, and everybody says they can, but there are not very many people, for example, in this situation that could have navigated this problem, and they would have been lost in no man's land trying to find out who owns the second lien. So short sales can be extremely problematic. Now, fortunately, I've kept the first lien holder in this example informed of what's going on all the time. So he has been very accommodating to me. And he says, look, just keep documenting what you're doing. If you guys can't close by the 27th of this month, he says, let me know and I'll see what I can do about getting an extension. So I'm confident, one, that we're going to be able to close. But if not, I think because I've established such a good relationship with this this particular investor, I think I'm going to be able to to uh, to make it happen. So, But this is one of those ones that would not happen if it wasn't for a persistent person like me with the ability that I have to to go to different links to try to get people's attention to 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 make for something to make sense. This should have been done. This should not have been this much problem. I mean, there's no reason this thing should have been this way. I mean, they burned Flagstar burned all this time with me just trying to find out where the loan was, and then they give me resistance when they finally get it on a on a purchase money non recourse loan. It just it doesn't make sense. But you know what? Somebody at Flagstar knew it didn't make sense. So. Kudos to Flagstar in this situation. And, you know, as I said, if you're in the middle of a short sale and you need some help, you need to call someone who knows what they're doing. So up next, I have a very special guest coming in the studio. After the break, we will talk to Brian Andrews, one of San Diego's top construction defect attorneys. You are listening to The Michael Gaddis Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. If you've got questions, we've got answers. AM 1170, The Answer. Hey, San Diego, Craig Sewing here. Look, one of the things that nobody likes to hear is that they got bugs in their home. Almost all California homes have some sort of bug or termite problem. It's not a cool thing to have bugs running around your house, so I'm going to help you get rid of them. I want you to connect with Lloyd's Pest Control. These are our good friends at the Craig Sewing Show. They can help you. They've been in business putting bugs out of business since 1931. They'll do a free inspection for you. If you want to get your biggest investment checked out, make sure there's not bugs or termites, go to LloydPest.com. That's LloydPest.com. Dot com and get a free inspection of your real estate today. Did you know that you can make up to six times more with vacation rentals than with long-term leasing? By investing in vacation rentals and partnering with Vacasa, you can cash your check while we do all the work. Vacasa is a full-service vacation rental management company. We handle everything from guest marketing and booking to home maintenance and security. If you want more information about Vacasa, please visit online or call 503-305-4520. Again, that's 503-305-4520. Or visit Vacasa.com. That's Vacasa.com. Vacasa. Vacation rentals made easy. Hey, Craig Sewing here. There's no shortage of commercials out there, whether it's TV, radio, even social media. And heck, I even saw an infomercial for solar. You see it everywhere these days. Well, it's because solar is important. It can reduce your electric bill. It's good for the planet. And it's just a great thing to do with your home. It can add value to it. However, there is so much misinformation. Just because somebody is out there advertising does not make them a reliable source. I want to introduce you to my good friends with Baker Electric Solar. The owner, Mike Teresa, I've got to know him really well. This is the only company that I would recommend for you to reduce your electric bill through solar energy. Such a smart move. It's time to do it. Here's how you reach out to them. BakerElectricSolar.com. Baker Electric Solar. They will talk to you for free. They'll give you an assessment, and they will help you reduce that electric bill. And again, this is the only group that I trust, BakerElectricSolar.com.
Who would you rather have representing you when buying or selling your home? A real estate agent or a real estate and mortgage broker who is also a licensed California attorney? To sell your home for top dollar, or if you're facing a forced sale due to divorce, probate, short sale, or bankruptcy, you'll need the added value and marketing services of a realtor with the knowledge and experience of a licensed attorney and mortgage broker on your side. Hi, I'm Michael Gaddis. I give you more, but it doesn't cost you more. Visit michaelgaddis.com. That's Michael G A D D I S.com. VRE 01465493 and I'm last to 800. Going through divorce can be very stressful. It is important to know your rights. I'm attorney Ilona Antonian. I'm a certified family law specialist. For over a decade, I've been helping San Diegans win their divorce and custody cases. If you have questions about divorce, property division, child or spousal support, modification of orders, or find yourself in a custody battle, please call us at 619-696-1100. Find us online at expertdivorcelaw.com where you can download our free divorce mediation and recovery guides that I hope you find useful. Welcome back to the Michael Gaddis Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. I am your host, Michael Gaddis of MichaelGaddis.com. This segment of the Michael Gaddis Show is brought to you by SolarFuse. If you are thinking about solar, go to SolarFuse.com right now. That's SolarFuse.com. Our special in-studio in guest today is Brian C. Andrews of the Andrews Law Group. You can see his website at BrianCAndrews.com. He is one of the top construction attorneys in San Diego. Brian, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on, Michael. Now, Brian, we've known each other for a number of years, and like me, you're a transplant. Why don't you tell us where you come from and a little bit about how you got into construction law? Certainly, Michael. My, my background was first in the construction industry. I was a licensed contractor in the state of Virginia, where I was born and spent about half my life. I've spent the other half of my life here in San Diego. Uh, came out here to go to University of California, San Diego, where I'm a proud alumni and uh, alumnus, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, then I went up to law school in Hastings in San Francisco. And uh, I always wanted to do construction law, having construction as my background and having law as the focus of my studies. Uh, it was a perfect fit for me to come out uh, and do construction law. I did so at several large firms, including uh, several here in San Diego, uh, before starting my own practice in 2006, which I've been running for the last decade. Well, I, you know, you, you corrected me a little bit during the break. Uh, you're not a con just a construction defect attorney. You're a construction attorney. So can you explain kind of what a construction attorney does and what a construction de defect attorney does? Absolutely. Uh, the, the phrase construction defect or uh, in, in the legal parlance CD uh, is a practice that mostly turns on uh, the, the California 10-year statute of repose California requires builders of, of new homes to stand behind their homes for 10 years, which is a long time, longer than in many states. And so a CD industry or construction defect industry has uh, cropped up in California, particularly because of this long statute of repose. More often than not, it's a situation where in the eighth or the ninth year, uh, uh, homes start to suffer from similar defects. Uh, you'll see an attorney group come in, usually through an HOA and try to recruit as many people from the neighborhood as they can who are having these problems. And so a construction defect lawyer is to some degree like a, a small class action lawyer in that he has this group of people that are all similarly affected by the same problems in their homes. And frankly, without any offense to anyone who, who, who does the work, it is noble work when it's done properly. It's all too often uh, a predatory uh, used to draw settlements out of insurance companies. And so I guess the, the line I draw between a construction defect attorney and an actual construction attorney is one like myself who not only has uh, industry experience, but who knows the contracting rules, knows the licensing rules, and who focuses his practice on resolving actual construction disputes uh, in the midst of building, after building, uh, or at any time during the process. As a construction attorney, I've represented owners who have problems with contractors. I've represented contractors who have problems with owners, subcontractors who are fighting with contractors, et cetera. I try to keep my practice spread evenly, keeps my perspective well-adjusted. I'm as aggressive at representing homeowners as I am at representing contractors or subcontractors where a typical construction defect attorney is always going to be on the side of the homeowner, 
He's basically going to be handing out a list of things that are wrong, seeking cost to repair, and trying to get insurance settlement. So don't be confused. There are a lot of good attorneys who do construction defect work. They may not be the best attorney for your actual construction dispute. And so I'll give the floor back to Michael by just saying a construction defect attorney to some degree is a one trick pony where a construction attorney knows the whole process has kept himself on both sides of the dispute and can help homeowners as well as contractors, subcontractors, bond sureties, school districts. I've represented them all, Michael. Well, let me give you a real life example of something that I just recently came across. I was showing a house to a buyer in Oceanside and he's been looking for a view home. So we went to this home and it sits up on top of this ridge and what we did is we actually went into escrow on it. And when we received the natural hazard disclosure statement, we found out that this particular lot was in red for high probability of landslides. And when my buyers researched it, because they're those kind of buyers, they found out that this, the soil under this particular property is susceptible to liquefaction. And so when we, ch we challenged the existing homeowner about it, they were saying, well, I don't, I don't know anything about this, but then we talked to the neighbor. The neighbor says, yeah, everybody in the neighborhood got this. We talked to the HOA. First, the HOA wouldn't talk to us. Then they said, well, it's in the hands of the attorneys. So I guess my question to you, is this kind of a, a situation like you would come across? or a Absolutely it is. And, and soils testing and being familiar with soils testing is a, definitely a skill a good construction attorney is going to have. And from my prior experience as a contractor, it, it, it soils issues, buried obstructions, soil conditions, are things that come up both in the new construction process and in the example you've given in the in the attempt to resell a property. So um, again, uh, as Michael mentioned, my firm is the Andrews Law Group and my website is briancandrews.com. And any sort of construction issue you might run into, complex or simple, uh, I, I could help with. And, and the example you give is something that would be something I've dealt with many times in cases. So what is the statute of limitations on on something like that? And for those of you that don't know, a statute of limitations is the time that you have to bring an action. What is the statute of limitations? Because like, this house was an older house. I mean, it was, I think, built in 1992 you know, or something like that. What is the statute of limitations on something like that? And so again, you get into the differences between a statute of limitation and a statute of repose. Technically, to enforce a contract, you only have four years but if you have evidence that defective work caused damage to property or caused physical injury, those claims do not completely uh, dissolve under the law in California until the 10-year statute of repose passes, which is a little different than a statute of limitation, but the effect is essentially the same. If you were to find any construction defect uh, that caused property damage or physical injury, you've got up to 10 years to try to bring that claim in most instances. Again, statutes of limitations, statutes of repose can present complex legal problems. So I'd always recommend that you talk to me or talk to a lawyer that you trust to, to analyze that. But if it's strictly a breach of a contract, you only have four years. If it's something that evolves from defective construction work, you can have up to 10 years in the scenario you described, I would think that the builder was probably off the hook for, the, for that issue uh, if the house was more than 10 years old from the time it was built. Now, if it went through a major remodeling that involved soils testing or new structural work and it had only been done four or five years ago, you might still be within a statute of limitation or a statute of repose that would allow you to file a lawsuit in California. But again, every case is different analysis of statutes of limitation and statutes of repose require uh, a, a qualified attorney to help give you advice about that. So, you know, contact one you trust or find me at briancandrews.com and give us a call at the Andrews Law Group. Well, in that particular situation, we backed out of the contract because of that. We just, my buyers didn't want any part of this, this, this type of, uh, you know, potential issue. So even though the defense by the, by the homeowner was, well, it's been here this long. So I don't know why, you know, why everyone's making a fuss about it. We're making a fuss because y your house is in a very hot, bright red section of the natural hazard disclosure statement. So that's why we are. That's why we have the natural hazard disclosure statement for all of you people out there. You guys got to look at them. So Brian, why don't you tell us what, uh, like a typical client is for you? What's a what's a perfect client for Brian C. Andrews? Well, probably the 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 perfect client uh, is someone who's running a, a good sized construction business, or someone who is a developer who is uh, developing uh, and having a, a large 
dispute with uh, with a builder or a subcontractor. But frankly, Michael, I don't mind telling you, I try to help everybody who calls me. I, I have a case going right now with a, a steel uh, manufacturer who uh, sent over a million dollars worth of steel to a Hurricane Sandy relief project out in New York. Didn't get paid uh, some of the extras that the uh, contractor agreed to. And uh, that case is set to go to trial in January. And it's it's definitely a million dollar plus case. I have many million dollar plus cases, uh, I'm proud to say, on my resume. And yet, nonetheless, people call me up with problems that are four and five and ten thousand dollar problems. And I strive to help every single one of them. So uh, rather than answer your question, which I already did about who the perfect client is, I'll say anybody who's got a problem that's worthy of hiring an attorney that involves construction, involves real estate issues or involves a, a contracting problem or a problem uh, arising out of a contract related to real estate or construction is a perfect client for me. Uh, the Andrews Law Group tries to help everybody, whether they've got a, a five-figure problem or a seven-figure problem, and we have the skills and the attorneys uh, to help do it. Well, Brian, we're just about out of time, but why don't you tell us how we get in touch with you if for anybody out there who might need your services? Sure. One more time, it's the Andrews Law Group. We're here in San Diego. If you were to Google Andrews Law Group San Diego, you would find us at my website, BrianCAndrews.com. Brian spelled with an I. And of course, you could always give us a call at 858-452-5600. Well, I want to thank my special guest today, Brian Andrews of uh, BrianCAndrews.com. Perhaps one of the biggest concerns that potential borrowers have about reverse mortgages are the costs associated with them. When we get back, I will break down the typical costs associated with reverse mortgages. You are listening to The Michael Gaddis Show on KCBQ AM 1170, The Answer. The answer. What if you could safely grow your retirement account with a reasonable rate of return with no risk of principal? Hi, this is Dave Harris with Wealth Preservation, specializing in retirement income and insurance planning. There is nothing I enjoy more than helping San Diegans protect and grow their retirement savings. For over four decades, we have helped families achieve financial success. If you need help with your retirement planning, please visit me online or call me today. My number is 800-313-PLAN or visit me online at wealthpreservationllc.com. Hey, Craig Sewing here. Look, I get asked all the time from craigsewing.com, who is my CPA? I got to tell you, this guy is the savant of tax planning. He's not just a CPA that does all the paperwork. He will actually help you coordinate a full-blown tax plan and asset protection. I have never referred anybody to Doug Jennings that was not able to reduce their taxes. Not once. And I've never heard anything negative. I give my highest recommendation to Doug Jennings at JenningsTaxLaw.com. You got to reach out to him. A free consultation and you'll see you might be able to cut your tax liability in half. Ethically, legally, it just takes a plan. Doug Jennings, JenningsTaxLaw.com. Reach out to him today, JenningsTaxLaw.com. Hi, this is John Beaudry, the landscape contractor. There's nothing I enjoy more than helping San Diegans create gardens where they can spend time outdoors in our fantastic weather and save money on their water bills. I've helped hundreds of people create outdoor spaces where they can literally live outdoors. If you need help with your landscape, I'll be happy to discuss it with you for free. No strings attached, just great advice. My number is 619-929-9140. Or visit me online at BeaudryDesign.com. That's B-E-A-U-D-R-Y Design.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Who would you rather have representing you when buying or selling your home? A real estate agent or a real estate and mortgage broker who is also a licensed California attorney? To sell your home for top dollar or if you're facing a forced sale due to divorce, probate, short sale, or bankruptcy, you'll need the added value and marketing services of a realtor with the knowledge and experience of a licensed attorney and mortgage broker on your side. Hi, I'm Michael Gaddis. I give you more, but it doesn't cost you more. Visit michaelgaddis.com. That's Michael G A D D I S.com. DRE 0146 5493 and MLS 2800. Your home should be a place that you love coming to. Hi, I'm Nikki Klug, interior designer, and there is nothing I enjoy more than helping San Diegans live in homes that they fall madly in love with. I've helped hundreds of homeowners experience a sense of luxury, rejuvenation, and inspiration in their everyday lives. If you need help creating a home that you love, please visit me online at NikkiKlugDesign.com or call me at 619-948-7173. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Michael Gaddis Show. I am your host, Michael Gaddis of www.michaelgaddis.com. I am also the CEO and NMLS licensed mortgage broker for Frontier Loan Group, Inc., or as we like to call it, FLG. FLG is licensed by the California Bureau of Real Estate as a real estate broker, license number 01449152. NMLS ID number 345305. I am also licensed by the California Bureau of Real Estate as a real estate broker. My broker license number is 01433800, and my NMLS license ID is 280011. Did you hear something on AM 1170, the answer that you want to weigh in on? Download the free AM 1170, the answer app to instantly call or email the station straight from the app. And remember, if you download the AM 1170 The Answer app, you have a chance to win a $100 certificate, gift certificate to Vigilucci's Italian Restaurant. And as, you, as I mentioned before, Vittorio, the general manager of Lucadia, of the Vigilucci's Restaurant, came in our show a couple weeks ago, and he, you, you really want to visit this restaurant. So this contest ends October 31st, so go out there and register and see if you can win. So how much does a reverse mortgage cost? Well, that is probably one of the most frequent, frequently asked questions that I get today. And that's one of the, also one of the major myths and misconceptions about reverse mortgages, that they're just so expensive that everybody's out there to, to, to get these uh, senior borrowers, which is not true. So, you know, as I mentioned, a frequent question that I might ask pertains to the costs associated. So, as I mentioned time to time again, obtaining a reverse mortgage can literally be a life-changing event for some homeowners. However, like anything that you would do, you need to do your research and you need to find out what's going on before deciding to move forward. And I'm sure lots of you, you've heard, lots of people have heard lots of different explanations about the initial reverse mortgage costs. So, I'm going to try to straighten them out for you a little bit. To begin, a reverse mortgage is a loan, uh, so you will have normal associated costs with acquiring a loan. And what are the normal costs? Title, escrow, little dock fees, things like that. So you're going to have the normal associated costs. Now, you will have, uh, um, you also have to pay for an appraisal. Um, and so, and so aside from these customary refinance fees, you will have to pay an upfront FHA mortgage insurance premium. Now, this is one of the two fees that when you see a breakdown of a reverse mortgage, that will kind of open your eyes a little bit because the FHA upfront uh, mortgage insurance fee premium, MIP, is, you know, can be a little bit expensive depending on the value of your house. And there's a formula that goes into that to determine how much you pay. But let me explain a little bit about what, it, what, you're, what you're talking about. So the amount of the MIP depends on what percentage of your eligible principal limit you take as an in initial disbursement. So that means the day that you close your reverse mortgage, whatever your principal balance is, there's a, there's a calculation that determines what the percentage is of your eligible principal balance, not of your necessarily of your value. So if you take 60% or less of your eligible principal limit at closing, you will have an MIP of half a percent, 0.5%. So, but if you take greater than 60%, you will have to pay 2.5% as an upfront mortgage insurance fee. That's a big jump. So if you're on the border between, you know, maybe half a percent or two and a half percent, you know, there's ways that, you know, like at FLG, what we try to do is run different scenarios for you to show you, hey, look, we can cap your MIP at half a percent, you know, so your, uh, your upfront, uh, you know, MIP fee and your closing costs are lower, you know, or if you want to make sure that you have a lot more available funds, you know, you can go ahead and pay the 2.5%. But we like to give everyone options. But I know it's a little hard to follow. But let me give you an illustration. Let's say you have a home that appraised at $500,000. And the youngest borrower on the loan is 70 years old. The amount of your eligible principal limit is based upon the age of the youngest buyer and is represented by a percentage of the appraised value of your home, or $625,500, whichever is less. In this case, the appraised value is $500,000, which is less than $625,500, so we are going to use $500,000. Now, the youngest buyer in this example is 70 years old, 
And the current principal limit factor for a 70-year-old is 0.576%. So basically 57.6% of the, of the eligible amount. Now, there's a chart that determines this, which I'll probably get into in a different show and break down how they determine those limits. As you get older, that number gets bigger and bigger, and you're entitled to more and more of your cash. Um, but so let's say we multiply the $500,000 value by the 0.576 factor. That gives us an eligible principal limit of $288,000. So in order to have a half a percent MIP, the initial disbursement cannot be greater than 172,800, which is basically 60 percent of 288,000. This includes any money, any amount of money eligible to you in the first year as a HELOC. And what does that mean? That means in your first year you can get a certain eligible HELOC. Say you close with a balance of one. Uh, let's say in our example, you have a 150 initial principal balance, but they also give you an initial first year open HELOC of 40 grand. Well, because you have access to those funds in the first year, they add that in to the amount. So that means that you're, you're dealing with a 190, not necessarily the, the 160 that we were talking about. So in this case, you would have to get a 2.5% MIP. Now, in this scenario, what we would do at FLG is basically give you two different, uh, two different proposals, one with a half percent MIP, the other with a 2.5% MIP. Now, we don't get the MIP. The MIP goes directly to HUD. So it's not like it's a fee that we get to collect. Confusing? Well, it might seem that way, but you know, if it's and it's hard to really relay that that particular information over the radio, but if you sit down and look at it on paper, it'll make sense. It just takes a few times to to look at the numbers and see how the equations work out, but you know, it, it's there. Now, some people when they come in, there's no way to 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 get around the two and a half percent MIP. The the initial eligible principal balance is just, I mean, your initial balance is just going to be too high. There's nothing we can do about it. But, you know, what is an MIP? Well, an MIP is a fee that goes to HUD, not the broker or to the lender. You know, the HUD uses that as its insurance fund in case of default. Now, in a reverse mortgage, you might be saying, well, the risk of default in a reverse mortgage is extremely low. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, there's, you know, the reverse mortgage distributions are based upon projected lifespans. So if you exceed your projected lifespan, that means that the investor could either go into a negative equity situation or, you know, you could eat up all of your equity. So at that point in time, the lender starts uh, incurring losses, which the, which the HUD is there to insure against. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, so many investors really like this particular program. So, you know, FHA calls it the MIP, and it's intended to cover basically your lender in the case of default on your loan. So... It's one of those things you really can't get away from. And so the lastly, I want to talk real quickly about origination fees. Origination fees are negotiable. Now, most of the time, like at FLG, it, depending on what your initial disbursement amount is, we can waive our origination fee, meaning you don't pay anything to us up front. And you can do that with other lenders, too. You just need to negotiate with them. Now, if your initial principal balance is really low or you know, very nominal, then we might have to you know, charge an origination fee. It just it depends on your particular set of situation. But you need to know that that is a negotiable fee. So keep that in mind. So in conclusion, you know, your costs could be treated... You know, your costs of uh, reverse mortgages are mainly, are mainly elevated by upfront MIP fees and potential origination fees. So, well, that does it for today. I want to thank you all for listening to The Michael Gaddis Show on AM 1170, The Answer. I am here every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. discussing anything and everything related to real estate. If you want to contact me with questions or topics for the show, please feel free to email me at michael at michaelgaddis.com. Contact me via Twitter at MGJD Realty. Call me at 888-242-2272. Or you can visit my Facebook page at Michael Gaddis Realty Group. Again, you have been listening to The Michael Gaddis Show on AM 1170, The Answer. Good night, San Diego.
According to CoreLogic, nationwide home prices rose 1.2% in August, and compared to August of last year, prices rose by 6.9%. Over the next 12 months, CoreLogic is projecting a lower 4.3% increase. Meanwhile, the Mortgage Bankers Association reported a slight increase in mortgage credit availability in September, thanks to a loosening of access to Fannie and Freddie loans, conforming no point 30-year fixed mortgage rates average three and three quarters, with 15-year rates closer to 3%. And now for something completely different, did you know that according to a survey conducted by Lifeway Research, 7% of Americans pray for finding a good parking spot? 13% pray for their favorite sports team to win a game. That figure may be a bit higher in San Diego. For more information on home loans or real estate, visit our website at aramco.biz or call me at 800-600-7021. This is Mehran Aram for The Craig Sewing Show.